Hey friend, welcome to She Said, She Said. Here on this podcast, I'm joining forces with top-notch guests to share life and career lessons, always with an eye toward insight, inspiration, and the drivers that help us build influence. I'm Laura Cox Kaplan. I've spent three decades mastering the art of influence. Whether you're starting a business, raising money for a cause, advocating for a promotion, or running your own household, understanding the different levers of influence will increase your chances of success, whatever your goals may be. Listening to She Said, She Said podcast may just be the smartest, most efficient investment you can make in you. Hey friend, welcome. Today we're talking about the power of story and how harnessing it can be an important part of your influence strategy. I'm talking about knowing how to create stories that help you both attract and retain an audience, stories that help you build support for a cause, stories that help you get invited to dinner parties, stories that win deals. It's a skill. And my guest today is a master at understanding and harnessing that skill and helping you do the same. Kendra Hall is a professional storyteller. She started winning awards as a child when she captivated audiences with her ability to tell a story. She took that talent and turned it into a career which includes not only keynote speaking about storytelling and the power of story, but also online courses, a successful podcast, and two books so far. Kendra's first book is entitled Stories That Stick, How Storytelling Can Captivate Customers, Influence Audiences, and Transform Your Business. That book debuted at number two on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, and Forbes magazine said it may be the most valuable business book you will read. Pretty high praise. Her second book is slated for release in January 2022. It's entitled, Choose Your Story, Change Your Life. Silence your inner critic and rewrite your life from the inside out. I love the title. And while I have not had a chance to read the book as of yet, I am really excited about it because it echoes a topic that we talk about on this podcast so much, this idea of mindset. Kendra will give us a bit of a sneak peek into that book, and I've included a link to both of her books in the show notes for this episode, which is episode 166. In today's conversation, though, we're going to dig into the power of story and talk about how to harness it to build influence. But we also will talk about how Kendra took her talent and turned it into something that provides a unique offering for others, despite naysayers who questioned her along the way. It's a really important component of Kendra's story. And now my conversation with Kendra Hall. Kendra, welcome to She Said, She Said. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Laura. I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm so thrilled to have you. I have been a big fan, not only of your book, the first book that was out, but also your terrific podcast called Success Stories, Uh which I really enjoyed. I know you've transitioned out. We'll talk about that in a second, but, uh, but I'm really happy to have you here today. Oh, I, I, as we were talking just briefly before, it's so great when two podcasters come together. So (laughs) female podcasters, even more so. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Let's jump in. You are a professional storyteller and you help others master this craft. I'd love for you to talk about why storytelling when it's done well, really matters. Yeah. I think that You know, there are so many different layers to the power of storytelling and more and more they're being revealed, I think, every day. Um, Stories are how we connect to people. They're how we relate. They're how we make sense of ourselves and the world around us. And I remember one of the first times. You know, as we look back on our lives and and we have these different moments, um, and it's only when looking back, we're like, oh, 
that was a moment. But I remember I was in the minivan with my family. Uh, I grew up in northern Minnesota. So we were, I grew up in Minnesota and then we had a cabin in northern Minnesota. So we would drive to the cabin on the weekends. And my dad was listening to sports on the radio. My mother was trying to read a book complaining that my dad was listening to sports on the radio. I was reading a book. My sister was asleep. My younger sister, she always fell asleep. And my brother was listening on his little cassette Walkman to a tape. And we didn't really know what the tape was. I wasn't really paying attention. Um, But he just kept laughing out loud intermittently throughout the car ride. And I'm an older sister. I'm annoyed by this. I'm like, why does this kid keep laughing? And so eventually it just became so disruptive, which, you know, if laughter can be disruptive, that we took the tape out of his cassette player and put it in the cassette player for the entire van. Um, And it was a tape that was recorded at the National Storytelling Festival, an event that happens the first weekend in October in Jonesboro, Tennessee, where storytellers come, people who all they do is tell stories. It's not with agenda or marketing or for sales, um, but just to share stories. And sure enough, that cassette tape started playing and you had five different people, me, my brother, my sister, my mom, and my dad. And we were young and they were old and we all came to life from very different places, if you think. And I remember the whole car being united listening to these stories. And it was one of those moments where you just realize in the disjointedness of life and work and people and chaos, a story really is a thing that can bring people from all different walks of life. Now, of course, I mean, it was my family. We're similar in many ways. Uh, but that is a, a power that no matter if you're in a minivan, no matter if you're in a boardroom, no matter if you're in the shower and you're talking to yourself just in your own head about your stories of who you are and what you're about. Um, Stories really, I mean, they run the world. Yeah. I love what you just did there because you illustrated the power Uh, of story (laughs) with a story. (laughs) I can't help it. I can't help it. It just is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There you go. You got me. You caught me. (laughs) I love it. I love it. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you got your start. You recognize this power of story, but when was when did that moment happen when you knew this was going to be something for you and how did you get started um it was again it was a series of moments i would have these standout experiences that um it started when i was very young i told my first story as an assignment in fifth grade um and again watched everybody Like I could hold them in the palm of my hand as I was telling them stories. I studied storytelling in college and for my master's thesis, examining the role of stories in organizational culture. Like how it, and this was even before culture was such a big and important word, or it was, but I feel like it's only gained uh, more importance in the, in the meantime, but watching within an organization, how stories shape the understanding of who we are and what we do. Um, At the same time, I grew up going to, after we heard that cassette tape of the National Storytelling Festival, I started attending the festival. I entered a competition where the prize was you got to tell at this storytelling festival. So Then I started going to storytelling conferences and more festivals and really seeing, and I think that's a big difference between myself and, because a lot of people now, especially in business, are recognizing and espousing the value of storytelling. But I didn't come to storytelling first from business or marketing. I came first from sitting in tents at the feet of great storytellers. Uh, But I think you know, there are many moments where we realize that, oh, maybe this really is something. Um, and the distance between the realization and when it really comes to can be uh, 
there could be a whole a whole lot of space between those two places. But I think that one of the big moments for me was I was in a sales role, in a marketing role, and I had to deliver for my role at the company. I had to deliver a keynote presentation, and it was really my first one, but it wasn't my own. It was mine, but it was in this role. And I really spent the majority of that time telling stories. And here was this motivated, um, hyper, you know, ambitious crowd. And you wonder, you second guess yourself, are the, are they going to listen to the stories? And they devoured it. And I think that was one of those moments where I thought, maybe... Uh, more people need to hear about this. Yeah. What do you think is the sort of oftentimes missing link? What, what, what is it that makes a story really resonate with an audience versus kind of that missing piece? Where do you find that magic? Because I, you know, I personally, I think it's really hard to tell a good story. And I think for a lot of people, your, yourself mm -hmm. in particular, you have, a, you have a talent and a gift. And part of that is captivating your audience, but it's telling and sharing a message that ties into a key point. Mm -hmm. But how do you learn to do that? And what is it about this craft of storytelling that sometimes people get wrong? Well, I think you could even see it right there. Uh, if you were to play back these first two responses that I gave, um, the first one, and I can criticize myself. I know, you know, like I can critique myself. Uh, the I think you did great. Well, so, so the first one, the first one, I told the story and I told about the minivan and what we were feeling and what was happening. And my guess is, Laura, you were, and the listeners too, you were in a mini. Were you sitting in the minivan with me? Were you for sure? You, you were picked. What color was the minivan? Yeah, I, I could smell someone's feet. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so that, so, so, and what I'm to answer your question. So that was a story. Then, if you were to go back and listen to my response to your second question, when you were asking, you know, when did you really get started? I kind of, I didn't tell a story. I told like maybe a mini, like a, like the beginning of a story where I was tell, giving a keynote at a sales conference. But I didn't, like you probably weren't in the audience with me or on the stage with me. And I, I talked about that I had these different credentials and this fascination. So so that's where people go wrong is, mm -hmm. it, but, but an average person would say that that second response I gave was, oh, she was telling her story. No, I wasn't. I was just telling you about me. But you're not going to remember that answer the same way you remembered my first answer. And, and that's where people miss it, is they don't tell a story. So let me, can I share with you another story? Yes, please. Just last night, I um, had the opportunity to go see this show on Broadway called Freestyle Love Supreme. And basically, it is a musical improv. It was started by Lin-Manuel Miranda. And they use the audience. You yell out words and then the actors and musicians on stage act it all out. Well, at one point in the show, they call out to the audience and they say, give us a word. Um, we need a word of something that you cannot live without. Something that just you love, like is a part of your life. Now, this is coupled with a couple exercises before that. They were like, what are the things that are really bothering you right now? And one woman yelled out, fake pockets, which women, right? Like, what? <laughs> and so they did this whole skit about fake pockets, which was hilarious and amazing. Yes. Okay. However, this time it was supposed to be something you can't live without. And the audience yelled things like money, which they thought was funny, chocolate. Uh, you know, there was like affection. They started yelling things out. And someone up in the mezzanine from the back yelled storytelling. And I was there with my girlfriends and they all, you know, and they all like start <laughs> elbowing me. And I'm like, I, I didn't, I have nothing to do with this. And then, so then the actors choose one of the words. So they could have chosen uh, money. They could have chosen chocolate. And, but the one woman said, I want to do, I'm choosing storytelling. And so then she starts, they, they, they 
make up this song. So there are three actors on stage. The first actor, well, the first actor tells a story in musical form. He's rapping it about his family being in San Francisco while he's here on Broadway and how every night when the show ends, he races to the dressing room because it's earlier there to read them a to read his daughters a book over FaceTime. And now they've actually moved to New York, but they're trying to get adjusted and they miss their friends and, and this whole, and so it has, you're picturing the daughters, you're, you're picturing him backstage reading the book. You're, and then the other two, and so it was just right. Like I can almost, I could recite it back to you. Um, The other two did a great job. However, what they said, the first said, I want to hear the stories from my grandparents. I want to be able to tell the stories from where I came from, talking about storytelling. And Mm -hmm. then the third actor, all he just kept saying is, I'm telling my story. This is my story. This is my story. But just saying you're telling a story isn't telling a story. Now, so so again, that's that's the difference is, is where people get it wrong is... They think they're telling a story because they say, I am telling a story. Um, But there there is, there's more to it. It needs those. And in Stories That Stick, I talk about the four key components that make a story great. And it's having identifiable characters, which in all of the, in the two story examples that I gave you, um, my own story in the van and the story of the guy on stage like you were picturing his daughters and you're hearing this second hand from me like I'm barely I'm trying to remember what he said last night but I I can I can it needs uh, so identifiable characters authentic emotion there needs to be real emotion in it um a moment a an opportunity for the listener to see themselves in the story and then to drive it home um very specific details. So even me describing the cassette tape, um, the Walkman, you were probably picturing that. The Mm -hmm. gentleman on stage last night said the title of the book that he was reading to his daughters. Now, I distinctly realized that his daughters are a different age than my kids because it was the title of a book that I don't know, but other people were laughing about it because they have Mm -hmm. kids that age and they're all reading that book to their kids. Long answer, but hopefully that helps to illustrate the the biggest missed opportunity. Completely, completely. I think it's the perfect illustration. I absolutely love it. Okay, so this season on She Said, She Said podcast, we're doing a deep dive into the levers that help us build influence. Mm. And storytelling, I think, is one of the perfect elements of this idea of how we build influence. But I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you see that connection between personal influence and storytelling. Mm. I mean, I think that because stories are programmed into who we are as humans, they are the most powerful. And at the same time, when used for good um, and not lying. Okay. So storytelling is not lying. Okay. It's not making things up, Um, but also the most authentic. Um, If you think about the people that you are influenced most by, they are people that you feel like, you know, and when we feel like we know someone, we trust them or we don't, but if it's, you know, let's go down the path of, we feel like we trust them. We feel like we like them more. We can relate to them. And that, that is all, those are necessary ingredients for influence. So in terms of outward influence, storytelling is, is an obvious choice. Additionally, I think some of the most, especially for women, the most important people we need to influence are ourselves and 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 to like influence us to to take that risk or to to move in this direction or to you know like like how do we it it need like influence internal influence is equally as important because if you aren't fully influenced by your own personal power and who you are and and what you're here to do outside of anyone else um how can you ever effectively influence 
outwardly. So, so I've found the personal influence, the internal influence is a journey um, for certain, just like most things are. But that's what I would say, how storytelling is important on those two very different, but equally as essential levels. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And it, it obviously takes us into your second book, Choose Your Story, Change Your Life, yeah. which I want to talk about in a second, but it, but it's, it's a really interesting lead up to that idea of the, of, you know, leading to the stories that we tell ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, and before going to talk a little bit more about the outward influence as well, um, because I said the word and I heard myself say it, the word authenticity, um, which is a big buzzword in business and one that that women are paying very close attention to. Um, we also have vulnerability. How do you, you know, how do you show your humanness? Um, and I think that, again, business is all about people. And instead of and and. And the wholeness, so you will be more equipped to influence people if they have a better sense for the wholeness of you as a person. The problem is we often edit that wholeness out. And a way to bring it back in our humanness is to be consciously sharing stories. I mean, almost systematically to be like, oh, this week I have a, our weekly meeting I need to make sure that I open it and or close it with a story, a story about me, a story about something that happened that week. And maybe it ties into like the key message of the meeting that week, but really seeing each one of those opportunities as an opportunity to re-inject humanness, which then only leads to more authentic influence. Right, right. I want to I want to state something that I think should be obvious, but that I think often isn't. And it's that your story is not just a story to connect with somebody, even though that's a helpful thing, but it's a story with a purpose. Yes. There's a reason why you're telling the stories that you're telling and it's leading to a point. And I think that that's oftentimes the piece that sometimes misses that people tell all sorts of stories yeah. and you're like, why the heck did they just tell me that story? Yeah. Right. And, and what it, because yes, there are stories that are designed just for connection. And then there are the stories that are strategically placed to illustrate a point to encourage a particular, to encourage and influence a particular behavior. And sometimes, I mean, most times I find it, it happens that we are we are more we will take more action we are more persuaded by the stories we hear than by the list of logical reasons why we should take this action and i also think that there's a really cool it's a technique i like to use a lot um is that story gives you this opportunity to respond and maybe even direct action, but doing it indirectly, almost like suspending, suspending your preferred uh, path forward so that the other person has ownership in making that decision. So you can tell this is unrelated to business, but I had a woman write me on Instagram and she, I had just taken my family to Hamilton. It was a big goal of ours. It was something very celebratory, especially having survived or continuing to survive the pandemic here in New York City. To be able to take my kids to Broadway to see Hamilton was a very big deal. A woman wrote me and said, my son has been, loves every, knows every word, loves the show. Like what? But I can't, his birthday's coming or his graduation's coming up or something. Is this, it's just so expensive. Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And I can't, I don't know how much money those tickets are obscenely expensive. Like that's right. a, that's a judgment we all have to make for ourselves. I can't tell her what to do. I think it would make a great gift. Um, so instead I wrote back with a story of a time in high school, someone gifted me tickets to the show that I knew every word to it was rent. Um, uh -huh. and that I still remember exactly what it looked like, what it felt like, 
to be sitting in that theater when the curtains opened. And it's something yeah. I will never forget. And the gratitude is still tip of tongue. So there, right there, I didn't say go buy the tickets. I was like, I can't tell you whether or not you should buy the tickets. Here's a story. And she was yeah. like, oh my gosh. And I think she probably went and bought the tickets. <laughs> oh, I love yeah. that. I love that. I love that. I think it's worth it too. <laughs> But you're right. It it's is also expensive. on Disney Plus, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the process that you go through. And you mentioned this a couple minutes ago, talking about the importance of reflection as you think about your stories, right? What's your process for developing stories and thinking, sort of thinking through those points and generating that material that you can pull from? What kind of process do you go through for that? Um, it, for me, it berries. I am constantly, um, right now, a lot of what I'm doing is watching the stories that are that are happening um, right in front of me. So there, you really have two options when it comes to story material, stories that happened in the past and you remember them or stories that are happening right here in front of you and you notice them. So actually that story about the show I went to last night I just remembered it when I woke up and like jotted down freestyle love supreme. Two people didn't tell a story. One person did. And I have a little notebook that I just like keep, I keep my little <laughs> stories in. So, so that that's, there's one side of it where it's having stories available. Um, and, and in terms of the story process, I often think about like, what is the, theme. If I need a particular story for something, what is the message I want to deliver? And then what is a story I could tell to illustrate that message? So it's that combination. And remember, it's finding the stories, uh, an event that has it, that there's a moment, that there's characters, that there are emotions. And sometimes it's harder to find than others. Um, I was actually just looking for a story, trying to find a story just earlier today. And I went out to the living room and I said to my husband, hey, I need a story about this. And I'm drawing a blank because a lot of times our stories don't sound like stories to us. They just sound like life, right? And so we right. don't see them for distill. And, and if that can happen to me as the person who's a professional storyteller. <laughs> it could certainly happen to you. But I went out to get kind of that outside perspective. And I said, what are, and then he gave me, he gave me a few ideas. It was like, okay, now I can go back and find like specific moments, specific events in my life to use as stories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I, I think that's great. You also do an amazing job on your Instagram, your Kendra with an I, K-I-N-D-R-A yeah. Hall on Instagram. You do a great job of illustrating this power of story through your Instagram where you're telling little vignettes with some regularity. And I, I love that. I think that's how I originally found you. And then I found success stories, but I would urge folks listening to take a look at Kendra's Instagram because it's really, it's really terrific. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about building a career as a storyteller. And I've heard you talk about the fact that when you first thought about making this a career, there were lots of people who second guessed you. Well, is that really a real thing? And, um, yeah. you know, how do you, <laughs> how do you, is this a real job? How did you deal with that second guessing as you were trying to get your start? I mean, I don't think second guessing is easy for anyone, you know, when you're second guessed about something, especially when you know, when you're just, when I was just getting started, I didn't know for sure. Like I was making it up. I, I didn't, I didn't know. And so, um, so it was, it was hard. I remember at the time, uh, when these, so I had left my job, my plan was to start this company for storytelling, but I didn't really know what it was going to be or what was going to happen. And then a week after I quit my job, I found out I was pregnant. Um, and of course we were delighted, but it kind of meant then that my made up job, would, <laughs> the baby took all of that 
great. I mean, my son, my firstborn is brilliant. I think he stole it from me. Like now that I think about it, I'm like, you took that. Because here I was, like I wasn't working and I was trying to figure out. So I went through so many different iterations. Um, and then when I finally, then I had a second child and and then I wrote a book of stories and that, you know, I was trying to find my way. And then I finally decided that I was going to teach people how to do storytelling. And yes, I had friends come and say, who's going to buy that? Like, what even is that? And I think that, um, I think that what I did, and this is something that I recommend to everyone is I didn't know if it was going to work or not, but I was very aware. So two things, number one, in those moments of self doubt, um, I would go back and very consciously look at my life and pull up some of those very key moments that sometimes just get lost in the, you know, they, they aren't key unless you, identify them or peg them or choose them as key right, stories. Right. But like the time that I told a story on a whim for a talent show for the Minnesota State Fair talent show and ended up making it to the final round and was telling a fairy tale to 15,000 people like and got second place because I went a little over time. I do that from time to time. Um, or like the, that my boss at the Outback Steakhouse when I was in college, who was just this like hot headed Costa Rican guy found out that I did this storytelling thing. And then he would have me tell stories to his key guests, which were the movers and shakers of Fargo, North Dakota, because the Outback Steakhouse was the fanciest restaurant there was. He would have me go to the tables while I was wait, have somebody else bring the Diet Coke to my table and have me tell stories in the Outback. Like there have been, I, and those are just, there have been time after time after time of happenings in my life. And I think anybody, if you were to look back over the course of your life and look for these and see them as stories, that it was like, this was destined to be like, this is, and I'm a big believer in destiny and like, and trying to find your way there. And these were the, in the new book, I call them the, the, the bricks on my yellow brick road to whatever this Emerald city was for me. And so I would tell myself these stories of, listen, I don't know where, I don't know how much farther I have to go to the Emerald city. I'm not even really sure what it looks like or who's there, or how yeah. to get in. But I have these stories that are showing me that this is the path I'm supposed to be on. Um, so that was a key thing. And I think that's really mm -hmm. important anytime you're facing self-doubt or you're trying to build confidence, kind of like Dorothy in her shoes, like the, it's in you already. You just have yeah. to choose to see it for that. And then the second thing that I I feel like I've always been pretty good at, we all have our moments. I mean, 2020 being one of them is um, understanding these pauses, these questions, these, is that really going to work? Um, as the middle of the story. Mm. Like, and what if you did just stop reading in the middle and you're like, I don't know how that's going to, like, don't you, <laughs> don't you want to see? And yeah, the middle is the part where you're like, where you, you, you want it to, you want it to, you want to see what happens next. I mean, you want to see right. where, I mean, my husband and I are watching Gossip Girl, um, the original one for the first time. It's like six seasons long. Every season is 25 episodes. I mean, it's pretty cheesy for the whole thing, but I want to see how this thing turns out. And I am, I dedicate at least one hour, sometimes two, to getting through the middle of Gossip Girl so I can see how it ends. Don't tell me. I don't know who Gossip Girl is. I have some suspicions. <laughs> don't tell me who it is. I know, I won't I know it's my own fault because I'm watching it 20 <laughs> years later. But so, so those two things, finding those stories that you can use as evidence, as the bricks in your path. And number two, being like, all right, yeah, this is the middle. I don't know how this is going to turn out. And there's so much freedom in that suspension. Yeah. And, and just being willing to 
to put faith in yourself and and in these moments. That's really it's really great advice. Okay, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the COVID experience for someone who is a professional speaker. You do some other things too, but a big part of your business yeah. is professional speaking before large crowds of people. Mm -hmm. COVID happens and you're not going to be speaking in front of people. So tell me about the last several months and what that meant to you and how you had to pivot. I mean, I think that for all of us now, however many months in, I stopped counting. I'm just going to round it all as <laughs> a <well>. year. It's <laughs> all one year. It may be 2020 and 2021 or hopefully not much of 2022, but it's all just one year for me. Um, that it really is the uh, great recalibration of um, what do I really want for my life? What, you know, what am I willing to sacrifice? What was important that isn't anymore? What wasn't important that now is? Um, for me, COVID started and the effects of, you know, I'm very... Fortunate, we we didn't have any immediate family members um, pass away, and so and our family remained healthy. I think we probably had it December 2019, honestly. But um, when March 2020 hit, we did. We I watched uh, hundreds of that, like my entire income vanish uh, overnight, and um, it, and it didn't. It just was. It we just didn't know what was going right. to happen. And, um, and then on top of that, you know, you're, we were in New York city, the, the city was desolate. Um, we had our kids at home trying to, to learn. But a big story for me that I'm always working on is money stories. And I think money story is a big story for anyone, uh, money. And then it ties to value and it ties to mm -hmm. self-worth. Um, and for me, it, it was a big, middle of the story moment um, mm. because I just, we just didn't know what was going to happen. And eventually events started booking uh, virtually and, and everything kind of evened out. But I remember, I remember one day having this one really big, important event, uh, like a dream event. I just couldn't even, I was so excited for it and it canceled um and i was so mad just like it could and i took uh, whatever it was it was a lip gloss in my hand which i'm kind of upset about and because lip glosses you know when you find a good one you know right. and i just <laughs> threw it across the room and i'm not really a thrower i was in my bedroom and i got off the phone finding out that this event had to cancel or go virtual or whatever and i threw it across the room i just screamed and i just ran out of the house and I remember I just ran into, I ran to Central Park. I didn't even say goodbye to my family. I just, I was like, if a bus hits me, fine, fine. Like, at least I don't have to worry about this anymore. And I sat down in the park and um, I yelled up at the sky. I was sitting there crying pretty much alone. There weren't very many people there. And I was like, what do you want me to do, God? Like, I've been following, you know, I've been laying these bricks. I've been building my company and you're just taking it all the while, like, give me a sign. I'm not one to yell at God and ask for signs, but I'm like, give me a sign. I was just sobbing. And this girl comes walking over and he's like, are you okay? He's like, no, I'm not okay. I can't even talk to you right now. I'm like what? <laughs> and she, she, she's like, my name is Anya, I know this is such a hard, do you need someone to talk to? I'm like, Good. <laughs> she's like, and then she started telling me stories of her family who was in Spain and she had friends in Italy and what it means to be a New Yorker and that we're going to get through this and enough for me to, um, to stop sobbing, but it was still like, and then she said, it's all, it's all going to be okay. And then she just disappeared into social distancing world. And I remember sitting there and saying to God, it's not good enough. Just some random woman telling me it's going to be okay. I know I asked for a sign, but I need something better than that. Like it was such a, like an immediate, but then I did feel this sense of calm, not, not, um, 
not the peace that passes understanding by any means, but this calm. And it was, again, this, um, you will tell this story someday and see it for what it was. Like, you again, you are in the middle of this thing right now. Someday you will be looking back on this moment. And, you know, I think the whole pandemic was that for me continues to be that. And I've been uh, just fascinated every day to be like, oh, this is the middle of a story. Oh, this is the middle of the story. Oh, look at, you know, my daughter just yeah. had a, a, you know, it's these lingering losses. Uh, she just had a big lingering loss. And, you know, to say to her, like, well, this is going to, you will tell this story someday when you're on the other side of it. You're giving her such a gift in helping her thinking about really reframing what's happening in that moment, mm -hmm. right? That this is an opportunity to learn and grow. You don't know where that experience is ultimately going to take you. So the, the your second book is coming out in January of 2022. Mm -hmm. we, we talked a little bit about that at the beginning of the conversation, but I'd love for you to talk about why did you decide to write this second book? Yeah. It, I'm really, I have to say, I'm really excited to read it. I've been reading the little excerpts, but I'm really looking forward to, to reading it because it taps into something we talk about on this podcast a lot, which is, you know, a, a version of this idea of mindset. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. In, in your case, it's the stories you tell yourself, but it's, it's also, it's the mindset yep. that you're approaching the experiences that you're having with. So talk about why this book. When, when was that moment where you're like, okay, this is the book I have to write You next. know, it's funny that you ask because the book I planned to write next, it, that seemed like a very natural progression as I was had released stories that stick. And, you know, you're when you're a writer, you start thinking about what's next. And I kind of, my thought was that I would write um, stories that stick, but like the leader like a more, mm -hmm. like more in depth on leadership or even women and like how women, mm -hmm. professional women can use stories. That's what logically made the most sense. But I started to notice even when I was on stage or when I was posting on Instagram or whenever I would talk about this idea of watching the stories I'm telling myself or, you know, making different choices in what stories I tell to help get me through a particular barrier or um, a limiting belief that those were the messages that lit up. Like I would get all the response to it and people started coming. And so it was a little bit risky from a publishing standpoint, if I'm completely honest. Um, I'm an mm -hmm. author. I went in to have a, like a conversation with my publisher, hoping that they would sign me again. But it seemed like it is a slight deviation. It, it, it still is right. storytelling, but it's more personal development. Of course, the stories we tell ourselves definitely impact our careers and our professional lives. Um, but they too were like, this is, this is exactly, and this was before 2020, you know? So, mm -hmm. so they were like, no, this is, this is the book that needs to be written. Now, of course, the challenge with that was, is I, I had been using it myself, this method, uh, helping my friends through it, you know, my family, but I had a lot of catching up to do in terms of having it book ready. I felt um, right. there was a lot of self-doubt, a lot of imposter syndrome, which let me tell you, it is <laughs> really, it, it, adds, it, it adds a little extra kick to it when your book deals a lot with the stories you tell yourself and self-doubt and imposter syndrome and thinking the things that you say that you can't and you're struggling with all of those things as you're writing uh -huh. a book about <laughs> so it was very i mean i'm exhausted i will say that um but yeah i think it was really i it was the book that seemed it wasn't the book i was planning to write but i think it was the book that needed to be read yeah can can you share any of your tactics or tips for, for, for lack of a better term, keeping your head above yes. water as you're dealing with, I mean, it is a, anytime you write a book of any kind, yeah. it's a, it's a deep dive into your soul and into, to being vulnerable with an audience in a way that maybe you haven't, haven't done previously. Now you have this previous book already under your belt. But this is a different, this is a different one. And so talk a little bit about what your tactics were beyond storytelling, 
how did you keep yourself above water? Yeah. It's funny that you say above water because a big um, metaphor or, or illustration that I use in the book is about um, the icebergs that we have these masses of things that lurk under the water that like seem to pull us down. Um, again, it, and it's going to sound so self-serving, but for example, just yesterday, I was recording the audiobook. Uh, it was my second day of recording. And <laughs> if you think writing a book that is much more personal as you, as you, as you just said, is uh, hard to do. Imagine then sitting in a booth all alone, reading it out loud <laughs> for six hours. And you're like trying to read it in a way that doesn't, you know, like that it's interesting to listen to like the tonation of your voice, but then you're reading things and you're like, and I got to a point where, where I thought there are too many stories in here. There are too many stories about me. There are too many of my stories in here. And, and I started to get like, I don't know. Like I could, I was saying the, yes, I was spiraling yeah. like the exact thing that, you know, we all deal with, which is what this method is meant to. And, and that's the thing is it happens. Even if you're practicing, this is a, this is a lifelong practice of um, changing and choosing better stories to tell yourself. So in that moment, in the moment, I couldn't really, I was doing too many other things like reading and trying not to shift in my chair. So I squeaked and had to start over making sure my stomach didn't growl because you got to start over if your stomach growls. Um, but on the- It's amazing that that will be picked up on the mic. It is. Like the, <laughs> the sound tech will be like, uh, can you, yeah, that was, I heard that, that one. I was like, oh gosh. Um, and so, yeah. And then you have that. And, uh, and then I was trying to get outside because outside affirmation helps right? Uh, and my sound tech the other day, I asked him, I'm like, hey, so what do you think so far? And he was like, I don't read this kind of book. I was like, gosh, this is so bad. <laughs> anyway. Um, he should have been a sheep. I know, exactly. <laughs> that was the- that was one of the problems. Exactly. And I was supposed to have a female tech yesterday, but then her computer broke. So I ended up having, anyway, <laughs> the point being, um, so one of the stories I was telling myself, which is so, I mean, the meta, the many layers of this is really overwhelming. One of the stories I was telling myself was that my book had too many stories in it, <laughs> okay, A, about me. <laughs> so, which which is the reason I bring that up is because, Laura, you just mentioned this is a much more personal book because it's a much more indiv individualized personal topic. So on my walk home, I knew that I had to directly um, approach that, attack that belief, that story I was telling myself. So I told myself stories of other books. This is one of those stories that I was using of other books that were huge bestsellers because the author was sharing their own stories, was, was opening up, was, you know, like Glennon Doyle's Untamed. I mean, you could, you could go back to, Girl, wash your face. Like I haven't read Tabitha Brown's new book. Mel Robbins' book is an instant New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. All of these women being very generous with their stories, um, and that made me that right there. I was like, and I could, I, I told myself the story of watching it, these women, and how I felt watching their success as confirmation that this is the right move. And then secondly, I went back through my catalog of memory. And, and told myself the stories of when I've, I've shared personal stories, uh, even in a professional setting and how people respond so profoundly to that. And that, you know, and then, so I'm going through, and then you add all this to it, right? I'm a big believer in the universe talking back to you. So I'm dealing, I'm walking home, I'm running home because I'm late after recording. This has all happened yesterday. I have to then go back downtown because I'm going to the show and then I'm sitting in the show still like trying, you know, shaking off the day and the doubt and everything. And I am sitting in the show and the woman, somebody even in the back yells out storytelling <laughs> and the woman on the stage chooses it as the word and they sing a whole 10 minute number all about storytelling. And I was like, okay, I will take that as a sign as well so but then all of these so then that becomes that moment 
with watching the Freestyle Love Supreme show last night. Now that is a story that I can tell myself that no, people are hungry for this. Um, I don't even know what your question was, but apparently I feel very strongly <laughs> about it. <laughs> I hope I answered it. I love that. And you did answer it because it was all about how you deal with these moments where you have that self-doubt, where you start to second guess and question yourself. How do you continue to plow through that? And when you're the person who's writing the book as the authority, it just magnifies that whole experience. So I, I love that answer. I think that's, I think that's perfect. Good. I'd love for you to talk a bit about um, Success Stories, which was your podcast uh, and affiliation with Success Magazine. You have recently transitioned out, but I would really like for you to talk about how one of the questions that you asked guests was how they define success for themselves. I'd love for you to take that question and also talk about, too, what you learn from the experience of hearing from all of these incredibly diverse and really interesting, successful people, very different vantage points. Yeah, I think that the one thing I learned is how much better they are at answering their question, that question than I am. <laughs> like I, <laughs> you're, I, I really, I need to write down my answers so that I can, so it would be only fair. So I'm going to pause that while I'll let the back of my brain uh, figure <laughs> out what my definition of success is. But at the time of uh, recording that those podcast episodes, that it was about a year, a year and a half um, that I that I was hosting that podcast. And, you know, it started in in the middle of the pandemic. It started with me asking myself the question, okay, so I'm not going to be traveling, uh, which used to take up so much of my time. What do I want to become instead? What do I want to do? Do I want to go back and get my PhD? Do I want to, what do I want to do? And the next day, mm -hmm. Um, I got a call from Success, and they were interested in a partnership, and so the podcast was born. And the reason I share that is because, like we've been discussing, the past 18 months, 20 months, however long it's been, has been this great uh, redefinition, I think. So many of us are are redefining or asking more deeply what success means to us. And the thing that I heard over and over again from from these incredible guests who I was asking this question is is that the definition of success is entirely fluid um, right. and extremely personal and and I think more than anything it's a feeling um, than it is a for almost all of them, it was more a, like a, a feeling than it was a checklist of items. And and I really had been trying to simplify success or quantify it for myself. And and in years past, in, in different phases of my life, like setting certain financial goals was a huge, that was my definition of success. And it worked. It was very motivating. It felt very aligned with who I was and, and what I was trying to do at the time. Um, that isn't necessarily the case anymore. And if I'm totally honest, it's been like kind of a free fall to not have something as uh, concrete as money or, or numbers to, to cling to for success. Mm -hmm. But all of these um, incredible leaders reassured me that that success really is it changes and um and it it's different for every person i think for me right now success happens i feel it in moments it comes in flashes and it's these like bright moments of i am doing what i am what me uniquely Kendra is here to do. And, and sometimes that's a moment with my children. Sometimes that's a moment after having a conversation with a friend who needed it. Sometimes it's a big stage moment. Um, but success is in these like little moments is what I've found for me. I love that. Okay. I have three lightning round questions. Oh, okay. 
Very quick. Okay. Where are you finding inspiration these days? A book, a movie, a show? You know what? Where I am finding inspiration on the streets right now. Um, mm. In in New York, just seeing people back on the street, like there there really is something about being out into in the community and not even necessarily having to talk to anybody, but just having other people around. That is feeling. I think I was really hungry for that and didn't even realize it. So that's where I'm finding yeah. inspiration. I love that. What's your favorite way to refuel or recharge? Um, we have a, so there's two things. We have a house out by the beach and I, I never really thought of like my, I never, I never really thought of myself as a beach house person. That was more a dream of my husband's, but um, like my parents would drive us in the minivan to our cabin in Northern Minnesota. Uh, there's something about this particular, we, we go out to Montauk, this particular house that every time I go, I feel very recharged. Um, now that's a big, that's a big one. Soul cycle makes me feel mm. that way. That's a place where I just feel 100% me present and um building legos mm, i love building go. lego sets <laughs> now now eventually your family's going to age out of that no, so you may have to find not, something have no. <laughs> i haven't aged out we are i no no i buy my own sets they have legos oh my gosh adults. like Seriously. i have i have a lego typewriter that's so cool like i have all the lego all the lego okay yeah. i'm impressed like, that's very mm -hmm. impressive <laughs> Okay, last one. Single piece of advice, life hack, or mantra. Maybe it's something that you wish you could tell 24-year-old Kendra, or maybe it's a life hack that you especially like, or it's a mantra that you tell yourself. What would be um, yours? Mine is definitely, and it sounds cliche, but go with me here. It's to be you. Um in, in so many different ways, you know, when you're the storyteller, that doesn't make any sense to people. Um, when you're really, when you're a really enthusiastic person in, in a world that is, everyone kind of wants you to be muted. Uh, I remember even back at the beginning of my, as I was hoping to become a keynote speaker, watching videos of other speakers to see what they were doing. And of course, I, it was usually videos of men because there weren't that many female keynote speakers. And even the way they moved across the stage, I was like, how do they move like that? And I'm like, oh, because they're in loafers and I feel most powerful in heels. Like it was, right. <laughs> but when I was trying to, I mean, success leaves clues. So it's good to watch others and, and gather and gather that information. But what I've learned time and time again is while there may be clues from other people, I still have to be me. Even if it doesn't make any sense to anyone else, I have to be me. And any, any time I, now I've gotten pretty good at it. I'm like, ah, this is me. Like, what do you want? I, I'm pretty good at that. But at 24, if I were to tell my 24 year old self, she needed to hear it. I love that. What a perfect answer and a perfect way to end this great conversation. I've so enjoyed getting to know you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for your, your great questions. And just thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, Kendra, I almost forgot. You have a special offer for pre-orders of book number two, which is coming out soon. It's available for pre-order now. Tell us about that offer. The book is Choose Your Story, Change Your Life. Um, you can pre-order the book now, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, indie bookstores. And then once you do that, go to the website, chooseyourstorychangeyourlife.com. Enter your info. Um, you'll up, need to just upload like the screenshot of your order. And then we have a whole, I'm, you'll immediately get a mini course um, that helps you dive into the first step of the choosing your story method. I'm going to be hosting uh, a 90 day series where every week we'll be attacking one of the big limiting beliefs that people have. Um, so make sure if you pre-order the book, to go to choose your story, change your life. So you get to take advantage of all of those things. I love that. We will include all of that information in the show notes as well. Kendra Hall, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. 
To learn a bit more about this week's guest, Kendra Hall, check out the show notes for this episode, episode 166. You'll also find the links that Kendra mentioned in our conversation, including links to both of her terrific books. Now, remember, you'll receive some bonus material for pre-ordering a copy of her soon-to-be-released second book entitled Choose Your Story, Change Your Life, Silence Your Inner Critic, and Rewrite Your Life from the Inside Out. You know, I especially loved how Kendra uses everyday stories and details to make her messages more memorable and to stick. What's so amazing about her message is that storytelling is available to each and every one of us. The stories she told in our conversation so perfectly illustrated her points. They were relatable and based on real world experiences. Undoubtedly, Kendra has an incredible gift for finding those stories and for weaving in the lessons and messages that she wants to impart. But I hope you found her advice and best practices for how to do so in your own storytelling to be helpful and a good investment of your time. Friend, I am delighted that you joined us today and I would love to hear what you thought of this or any of our She Said, She Said podcast episodes. You can send me an email via the contact link on the website at she said, she said podcast.com or message me on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. I'm at Laura Cox Kaplan. I'd truly love to hear from you. Also, you may have noticed that we have a new look and I'd love to hear what you think of that as well. Until next week, take care. I'll see you soon.